Welcome to another episode of Eric Wade Whiskey Studies. This is episode two of our study of Scotch whiskey history. In this video, we're going to talk about the expansion and legislation of Scotch whiskey. Uh, as I go over my notes, I'm going to be enjoying a dram of the Ardbeg Grooves. Uh, this was uh, last year's special release, although this is not the committee release. This is the uh, regular bottle, still somewhat available, around $120. Uh, and yet, uh, I think they're running a little low these days, uh, since we have now the Ardbeg Drum uh, that just came out. Um, really, really nice whiskey. This has been uh, finished uh, in uh, X wine casts that had extra grooves in them uh, to get more uh, interaction with the wood. And so, uh, if you haven't tried this, I highly, highly recommend it. Alrighty, so uh, as I mentioned in the last video, the primary textbook uh, for this class is The Science and Commerce of Whiskey by Ian Buxton and Paul Hughes. Now, we talk a little bit about um, illicit stills uh, as encouraged by the conflict with the excisemen, the taxmen. Uh, when the government becomes oppressive, um, whiskey production tends to go underground. Whether you're talking about prohibition in the United States or just heavily taxes there in the UK. So another really good book on that topic uh, is Scotland's Secret History, The Illicit Stilling and Smuggling of Whiskey. This is by Charles McLean and Daniel uh, McCannon and really well illustrated as well. Really, really a nice book. So let's get into it. While much licensed whiskey making, particularly in the Highlands, was a small scale and a relatively localized affair, the development of major commercial distilling in the Scottish lowlands accelerated following the pass of the Gin Act in 1736, which imposed heavy excise duty on gin in an effort to curb drunkenness while exempting whiskey. However, lowland whiskey tended to be a poor quality and was much exported to England to be rectified into gin. At the time, most London gin was made from sugar rather than from grain. So, just sort of reemphasize taxes, taxes, taxes. A much of the history of Scotch whiskey and bourbon has to do with the conflict over taxes. The two intermarried families, the Steins and the Hagues, were responsible for a great deal of this commercial lowland distilling, creating distilleries that by any standards were vast in scale. Two of the largest were Kentipens and Kilbegi, situated in the county of Clackmanshire, and both in the hands of members of the Stein family. So these are two families which we don't hear about much today, because the distilleries are now extinct, as you saw there in the photos, uh, the um, remnants, uh, the ruins of the distilleries somewhat uh, are still there, but you can't, they haven't been rebuilt and you can't get anywhere close to them, um, but there are some good photos and videos out there. But it's an important part of understanding the very early hit part of history of Scotch whiskey. Andrew Stein established a distillery at Kentipens around 1720, a little more than a decade later, it was the largest whiskey-making facility in Scotland, then being in the hands of Andrew's son, John. John Stein had 12 children in total, many of whom continued the family's distilling traditions. James founded a large distillery at Kilbeggy, one mile distant from his father's Kentipens distillery around 1777. Robert established Kincapel Distillery at St. Andrews. Andrew purchased the Hampton Burn Distillery at Milton Thort, and John Stein Jr. eventually took over his father's interests at Kentipens. During the later years of the 18th century, Kentipens and Kilbeggy distilleries were operating on an unprecedented scale. They represented the perfect nitrogen cycle waste from the distilleries was fed to pigs. <laughs> The excrement was used as fertilizer to grow grain, which was then made into spirit. Production rose to such levels that, at one time, the duty paid by the two distilleries was greater than all the land tax collected annually in Scotland. Kilbeggy was the first Scottish distillery to export spirit in bulk, 
While the earliest railway line in Scotland connected Kilbeggie with the harbour at Kentipens, and one of the first canals in Scotland joined the two distilleries. Getting a little bit of parched with all this talking, let's take a little wee sip. Mm. Mm. This one has a, some real nice spice to it. Definitely has some red fruit notes to it. That red wine is really showing itself, but also has some nice uh, sort of chocolate, chocolate covered uh, cherry notes. If you haven't had the Ardbeg Grooves and you can still get your hands on it, I highly recommend it. Output for Scotland stood at 114,833 proof gallons or 522 and 41 liters in 1736. But the following year had more than doubled to 264,376 gallons or 1.2 million liters. It rose to a peak of 543 and 38 gallons in 1752. However, a series of major crop failures led to the prohibition of distilling throughout Britain from March 1757 to December 1760, and in 1761, output stood at a meager 48,035 proof gallons, or 21,837 liters, though the industry subsequently recovered during the latter decades of the century. So one of the things we want to take note of is what are the cause and effects for um, booms and busts in the whiskey industry? So we see taxation, we see um, the imposition of, of the government, we see uh, food famines, we'll later see wars. These are the things we want to pay attention to in history uh, because we'll see that not only if uh, Scotland is at war, but even if things are going on in other countries who are the consumers, such as the United States, if they have prohibition, if they have war, if they have famine, if they have you know, an economic depression, the result is it feeds back onto Scotland. So it's important to pay attention to things outside of the immediate Scotch industry uh, to recognize the cause and effects of booms and busts because right now, in 2019, we are experiencing a boom and you want to keep your eye out on a thing that could lead to a potential bust. Elizabeth stilling remained a major problem, however, encouraged by the high levels of duty levied on legal spirit and the unpleasant flavor of the whiskey from the great distillers, and additionally, the comparatively fine quality of the much illegally produced whiskey was attractive to consumers, and those distillers operating within the law frequently resorted to fraud in order to maximize profits. The ultimate governmental response was the 1774 Act, which prohibited the use of stills below 400 gallons capacity and spirit stills less than 100 gallons capacity, effectively excluding all the so-called small farm distilleries. During the 1770s, the great distillers sought to undermine illicit production by flooding the market with cheap whiskey. And in 1781, the government banned private domestic distillation and allows excise authorities to seize whiskey, whiskey making equipment, and later on even horses and vehicles used in the transportation of illicit spirit. A premium of one shilling and sixpence was offered to anyone handing in illicit stills to the authorities, though this measure tended to backfire as many shrewd smugglers gave up old worn out pieces of equipment and bought new ones with the reward money. Research in Kentire was shown the illicit trade was remarkably well organized with its own informal credit networks controlled by molsters. Mm, I love scotch. I love scotch. Scotch is got scotch. So one of the things we see here is every time the government tries to, oh, be draconian in its laws and really sort of overly interfere uh, with the free acts of individuals in making whiskey, it always seems to backfire. When smaller stills are made illegal and you have just the big boys making whiskey, the big boys are producing quantity rather than quality, so the better whiskey is the smaller uh, produ producers who are operating illegally. So then what do they do? They go, well, I'll tell you what, we'll be such the nice guys. We'll be the government who, who are your friend. We're going to um, give you money 
for your illicit stills. And of course, the smart ones go, okay, what I'll do is I'll turn in my old worn out equipment and then with the money I get for turning in my old worn out equipment, I'm gonna go buy new equipment. Okay, we've had similar things here happen in the United States, but I'm not gonna go uh, into that. Alrighty, so that's it for uh, this particular lesson. In the next uh, video, we're gonna look at the Farron uh, Tosh exemption. You say, well, what the heck is that? Well, hang in there, it's gonna be in the next video. Alrighty, if you subscribe to this channel, I wanna thank you very much. If you haven't yet subscribed, but you like watching my videos, I would greatly appreciate if you would subscribe. Give us a thumbs up, share with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, and other social networking channels. And until next time, Cheers.